up to a number of people. We sent out quite a few workers out and quite a few uh, uh, missionaries out, and that's by the grace of God and uh, attributed to the uh, uh, wisdom of our fellowship, obviously. And, uh, but also there are some things that I've learned over the years of my personal experience. I want to share with you some of the things obviously are, will be familiar. There are men here that are seasoned warriors and seasoned pastors. Uh, but maybe you will find and the disciples here aspiring for ministry will find some help in this, um, in this uh, sermon. John 6, after these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the, is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs and uh, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who had five loaves of bread and two small fish, but what are those among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there were, uh, was much grass in the place. And so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, and much as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves uh, which were, uh, were left over by those who had eaten. I want to take a look at this text from the perspective of building a, a larger congregation this morning. And uh, I, I want to tell you off the start that I believe that uh, it's all about feeding. I, I have a, a man that I've, I've I, I, you might know him, uh, Frank Beneventura, pastor of the Devout Church. He is a former uh, owner of the restaurants, and uh, he still, there is a uh, tremendous congregation uh, there in Davao and the conference. Uh, they hold a conference and uh, he feeds the whole entire week. He feeds about 1,500 people uh, every afternoon. He is able to feed that many people uh, because he knows how to do it. If we would all show up in uh, one of your sisters sitting in this place, if all of this assembly would show up in your house tonight, would you panic? Oh, you definitely would. It's, it's, see, I believe that growing a church is all about feeding the flock. That's why uh, God gave me a while back a revelation about this text, that this text represents a guideline for what God wants to do in our churches. And there are three areas here I don't want to uh, minister about, and one of them is building a momentum. In verse 2 it says, Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. See, I believe that number one, uh, when we talk about building an audience and building a momentum, is that uh, miraculous. I believe uh, still that miraculous draws sinners like nothing else and builds churches. You know, miracles really build churches. We need to aim at and uh, uh, focus on in our uh, ministry, in our congregations, at miracles because miracles do work and, uh, and they are the best advertisement for the churches. And I remember when I was pioneering my first church, a man that was paralyzed because of the neck injury. A father of one of my new converts, uh, we, uh, he was uh, paralyzed and brought into a uh, ICU unit. We went into that hospital and told the doctor that we would pray for this man. He was in ICU at that time. The church was very, very young, about six months old. And I gathered my new converts and we started praying in the evenings three nights in a row. In three days he was out of the ICU. 
Then the new convert, son of, of this man, went into the hospital every night for the rest, for, for several days in a row. He would put his paralyzed father, who was nothing but a drunkard, uh, an abusive, violent man, he would put this man on a hospital bed, wheeled him into the shower room and prayed for his father all night because this is what he was taught by his pastor, me. And after he did this for several nights in a row, uh, two weeks later, the ch the, he, this man walked into the church and uh, 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 completely healed, got gloriously saved, and needless to say, that brought a, con a, a supernatural contending for miracles. And this is nothing, nothing the devil can do when the young pioneering church is fired up about miracles that are taking place in the that little church. See, we need to contend for miracles if we want to build a congregation. And we need to contend. And unless we contend for it, unless people pray and fast for it, nothing is going to happen. Unless we put ourselves in vernal, vul, vulnerable, that's the word, vulnerable position of failing. Uh, and if a person don't get healed so that Jesus gets all the glory when he does heal that person. I believe when we speak about miracles, we need to touch on miracle conversions this morning. We have to aim our ministry, and this has to be a passion of our lives, to see not just an addition of a nice couple. A ble God bless these nice people that add to, uh, God adds to the churches, but it's nothing like a miracle conversion, a supernatural conversion of somebody that's a notorious sinner in the city. That's what we need. That's what we are, have to contend for. I remember how I was preaching a revival in my church as an assistant pastor uh, because someone canceled. It was too cold. Uh, it was really going bad because it was a January of Russia. January weather was very cold. It was around 35 or 30 below zero. And a, mo a man walked in. He was 18 years older than me. I was 22. He was 40. He was a mafia boss in, a t in, in, that, in a town. At one point, considered one of the most dangerous men in our city. He had, uh, uh, t he, uh, you know, tattooed all over many times into jail. Had waxed, uh, uh, wax uh, injected under his skin. His, his uh, um, arms were very deformed. His fingers were very ugly. But uh, they were very heavy and also lost, uh, he lost all the sense in his arms. So when he was fighting, he was uh, a killer machine. And this man, Victor, he was, uh, he was gloriously saved uh, and uh, a tremendous uh, miracle transpired. He went throughout the city and uh, everybody, everybody knew that this church, the Potter's House, is for real because this man was saved. I made it my own, uh, my own desire and passion to see conversions, real conversions, genuine conversions, because there's nothing better that builds momentum when we, when we see men that testify that were one time destroyed by sin and now saved by the glorious blood of Jesus Christ. Also, in building momentum, good preaching really helps. It attracts people. Jesus, see, the, there is a reason why people followed him is because he was the man that attracted sinners. The Bible says in Luke 4.32, And they were astonished at his preaching, for his word had authority in it. In John 7.46, the officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. I read a book by Tom Reiner on breakout churches, and he speaks about, he compares uh, leaders, churches that have a breakthrough with churches that have reached a plateau and uh, mediocre churches. And he says that pastors of the churches that are growing put in 20 hours in uh, versus five hours of study of the pastors that have mediocre churches. This is a quote from that. Uh, book. Do not all pastors preach. Do not all pray. Hey, I have good news for you, or bad news rather. The answer is that only a minority spend significant time, uh, significant time in these foundational ministries. In our research, 
on effective evangelistic churches, we found that the leaders spend approximately 20 hours per week in the sermon preparation and prayer. The leaders of the comparison less evangelistic churches spend only five hours per week in sermon preparation and prayer, and only 4% of churches in America met our criteria to be an effective evangelistic church. We, I want to believe that in our fellowship things are better than in just a, your generic religious church, but uh, I, I, I beg you to be a man that uh, makes preaching his passion. I was speaking with uh, Pastor Richard Ruby. I, I just called him a few months back and I said, Pastor, what, uh, 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 what, do you, what can you name no, number one priority when you're home, uh, when you're not uh, away preaching somewhere besides your family? He says, besides my family, my number one priority when I'm at home is writing good and quality sermons. And listen, we have to dedicate ourselves to learn how to preach. In the beginning, I personally can tell you, I preached Pastor Mitchell's sermons. I took them word for word, wrote them down, preached it. I actually joked with Pastor Mitchell a while back that I can preach his sermons much better than he can. And of, obviously this is a joke, you know. I'm not, you know. But we need to become obsessed, amen, with the sermon preparation. We need to love preaching. Preaching should be our passion. We need to be excited about the preaching of God. God's word. It's very interesting. In 1 Timothy 3, it says there is a faithful saying, if a man desires uh, the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. See, see, before the qualifications are listed by Apostle Paul to Timothy, whom he needs to choose to become a bishop, he says number one qualification of a future preacher is a desire to preach. Can you say amen? This is what needs to happen, and he uses two words, desire, that are totally different uh, Greek words. One means actually to stretch forth, to long for something, and another word is actually, uh, is actually um, uh, coveting or lusting after uh, something. And I know this uh, can go every, any direction, but uh, the, really what the Apostle Paul is saying, unless a man has a... a, a a desire, a sincere desire, he's stretching himself to become a preacher, he will lose focus one time and he will not be able to gain it. This is very important. If you want to build a momentum, number three is we need to crack the responsive people group. She, see, Jesus had a responsive crowd of sinners. There is a reason why he went to the Gal Galilee and they spent most of his ministry, if you studied that, in that uh, a part of um, um, Israel, is because there people were the most responsive. And we need to find out where, what, where those people are and touch their lives and touch their, uh, touch their hearts. And I'm not talking about your refined, beautiful, having it all together kind of nice people. But the outcasts many times, the riffraff, worthless people that are overlooked by everybody else, wretched men and women of the society. I am a strong believer in reaching that kind of people. One of my favorite sermons is Gospel to the Poor by Pastor Mitchell. You can find it in an old book, uh, We Can Take the Land. I remember how uh, about nine years ago or ten years ago when our church was around 200 people and it, was, it reached the plateau, it wasn't growing and I got very desperate and got totally involved into the ministering to the drug addicts. Uh, one of them showed up in our church and he had, uh, you know, his jaw was broken, he could not speak, he could not open his mouth, he was in a poor shape. We uh, sheltered him in one of our Christian's home for a night he stole all of the uh, valuables from that family and ran away and I had other experiences that were very likewise very very bad experiences with these uh, uh, stinking drug addicts but um, uh, and nevertheless I saw something I saw beyond that there was a, a jewel inside uh, that I felt and if I felt that I need to spend my life and spend 
my time and spend our resources to be able to touch those lives. Long story short, we have started a drug addict ministry, uh, a recovery ministry, a rehab ministry in our churches. There are uh, seven or eight rehab centers right now throughout Russia in, one of, in, in our pioneering and in our churches of our fellowship. There are 100 men right now that are going through that rehab pro program, 40 of them staying in my church building. We have 16 pastors as a result of that ministry. And I told a number of uh, different uh, uh, leaders and, and, and Bible study leaders and, and, and door uh, uh, directors and you name it and pastors' wives as a result of that ministry. It was hell for one year and a half, but I went forward because I felt this was the responsive group and as a result, we have a momentum going in our fellowship right now. And the sad news is these people are everywhere, but pastors and churches need to rise open in order to see them and the fourth thing that about building momentum is we need to use unconventional approach see if we have to if we do the same thing over and over again without any results uh, we are lunatics we are crazy we have to. You see, the problem with us is many times uh, we uh, think that uh, we, th we cannot think, and, and it's a cliche, we cannot think outside of the box. And you know, we have in our fellowship tremendous principles. And these principles are awesome and they are powerful. Principles of discipleship, principles of ministry, you know, the standards which I dearly love. But we need to understand that we many times mix the principles with methods. The methods can be changed, but the principles need to stay the same. And many people don't get it. They think that we need to keep the method. But no, 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 we need to keep the principle. You know, when I started the drug addict ministry, there were pastors, dear friends, that came to me and they would approach me and they would tell me that this is not what we do in our fellowship. I got so vexed that one time we already had a bunch of men saved. One time when Pastor Mitchell came for a, uh, um, um, for a men's rally, I set him down, him and Pastor Greg. I walked him through the whole thing and I said, Listen, Pastor, if this is not what our fellowship is, I will stop it in no time. I want to be the fellowship. And he looked at it. He saw what God was doing and he said, Listen, you keep doing what you need to be doing. This is of God. The men are rising up they are being discipled listen the principles need to be need to stay strong but the method can change and that's what many people don't understand we, we are not parrots right we are not parroting things we need to think for yourself we need to understand uh, that, uh, you know, there are other issues involved. Uh, and unless we use unconventional approach, we will never be able to have revival. And we need to understand why we do what we do, not just do what we do. And that's what I see many times in men and pastors and churches. They do it out of just sheer, you know, I, 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 we're just doing it. We're in the rut and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we're doing, we're, we're the fellowship. Who taught you that? We need to keep the principle, but we can change the method. I want to look secondly at building men uh, this uh, morning. That's another thing that God is showing us in our text, another revelation. In verse 5, we see how Jesus brings this need to Philip. He says, where shall we buy bread that this may eat? And then the Bible speaks about the response of Philip. He, he's, he's full of unbelief. He doesn't know what to do. And then uh, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, stands up and he responds with his famous, I have this lad lunch of five barley loaves and two small fish but what is this to so many for, uh, for so many this is not enough and as i look at this text i realize jesus is doing something and one of the things he's doing is he's encouraging initiative you know why would he talk to philip of all the men that were surrounding him 
One commentator says that it was because he was a man from that area. He lived nearby uh, originally. And so for him it would be easier to say, I can go to my hometown. I can gather whatever I can do. In other words, he could think um, of natural ways of uh, responding to that need. But Jesus was challenging their faith. And he encouraged that initiative by pushing the man over the edge, by challenging their faith. And um, one of the commentators says he directed his discourse to him, particularly to Philip, because he was of Beth- Bethsaida, near to which place Christ now was, and therefore might be best able to answer the following question in a physical realm. See, we need to understand what Jesus is doing in our text. And he's striving to challenge their faith as as often as possible to push them over the edge so that they learn how to fly. You give them food. For he he knew, the Bible says, what he wanted to do all along. I remember my discipleship early days as my pastor shocked my senses quite often. And from the beginning of my uh, walk with God, he was the man that would push me over the edge, always and constantly trying my faith in many, many different scenarios and situations. And uh, unless we break this in lives of our disciples, unless they get out of the mold of logical approach to issues of life, then we can never have successful disciples that can take the world for Jesus Christ. One uh, interesting idea that uh, is found in our text is we need to notice starters and encourage starters. Create such an atmosphere, and he created that atmosphere in that uh, assembly of men that uh, men were not afraid to speak up. You know, it's interesting that the Bible speaks sometimes in between what he's what it says. You know, if you look at what the Bible does not say, you can get a revelation. The Bible does not say that the disciples laughed at Philip's suggestion. And Jesus did not make a belittling comment to Philip. He did not make that comment. Oh, Philip, you are of a little faith. What you're suggesting is of the devil. Get behind me, Satan. He did not say anything to Philip. And I believe partly because he was throwing an idea out, looking at his disciples, who is going to catch it. But he was very careful not to brand the disciples, not to belittle men with uh, crazy ideas, with uh, any kind of suggestions. And I believe this is very, very profound. That's why, because there was no belittling going on in in, uh, uh, Jesus' ministry. That's why Andrew... Simon Peter's brother could actually respond and could actually clear his throat and speak up and have a suggestion. And do you read this in our text? Will you agree with me that when Peter's, when Andrew rather is suggesting that uh, boy's lunch, he is not sure of himself. In his own words, he speaks and says, There is a lad here who has five loaves, uh, barely loaves, and two small fish. But then he says, but what are they among so many? It's almost like he's doubting himself. He's not very sure if his suggestion is right. But he still speaks up because Jesus, can you say amen, has created such an atmosphere in that church where people like Andrew could actually suggest an idea without being ridiculed, without being laughed at, belittled, and pressed down by all of the other disciples. There was no laughing in that discipleship process. And he wasn't sure if he was doing a good thing suggesting that lunch of a little boy but he never got a response from Jesus Christ. And, and it, we don't re- read about belittling in that situation. I, uh, one, somebody sent me a video when we talk about starters, starters, not stutters, but starters. 
who are able to start, to initiate, to create, and to launch. Somebody sent me a video of a guy in, uh, somewhere in Africa. I love that video. He is whistling away. He has a shirt uh, stretched out on his bed, and he had a pot uh, of hot air, and he is ironing his shirt. You, you hear, uh, you know, a chicken on the background. Obviously, it's a rural area. I don't know if he has electricity or he has an iron, but he needs to present himself in the job this morning, probably all ironed up and dressed up. And so he doesn't have any other suggestion but take a, 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 hot, a, iron, a hot pot, uh, you know, boil the water, and he's whistling away, and he's ironing his shirt. Oh, I love this kind of people. Can you say, man, this is what we're looking for in our men people that can start that can initiate Andrew was a starter he brought Peter his brother to salvation Paul the Apostle was a starter he was a missionary and he began ministry he started preaching right away you know and he was a starter Peter himself was a starter everywhere he walked everywhere he he was we read of him walking on water jumping into the water speaking first when uh, he had to proclaim Jesus the Christ and etc uh, etc et P- uh, Philip was a starter he brought Nathaniel see these men that surrounded Jesus were the initi- people that initiated and created and were able to launch ministries in our fellowship every outreach idea was started because it was suggested by people of the church that's what Pastor Mitchell says We cannot create an atmosphere in our churches that discourage those people. Jesus never mentioned anything to Andrew concerning his idea or Philip. We have to look for starters. I admire those, the initiators, the movers, the shakers. We have to be as pastors, starters ourselves. You know, we have to be people that have a fresh look in our city. I once heard Pastor Warner make a comment. They asked him why he had such a successful church and successful ministry. And he said, I never stopped pioneering my city. Can you agree with me that this is a a key ingredient to be able to look at your own church or your own city with a fresh look and say to yourself, uh, let me re-pioneer my city, let me have a fresh idea, and I believe that comes from God. If you ask God for wisdom, God's going to give you one. Finally, in my sermon about building a church, I believe building a structure is also necessary. In verse 10, it's very interesting. The Bible says that Jesus told people to sit down. He said, make the people sit down. And then it's no coincidence that the Bible says there was much grass in that place. You know, I believe that uh, the reason why God is saying this is because He wanted the butts of those people to be comfortable and nice. Right? We know, we, we know what Israel is like. If you've been on a trip to Israel, it's all sand and rocks. Uh, and then it's very interesting that it was at that place where there was much grass. And the Bible specifically mentions that to be able to tell us that Jesus took care of little things that are very important for bringing the church to a next level. I believe organization of the church is as important as the spiritual things. You know, successful church is uh, successful in every other area. In excellence of the church is excellence on, in, in the outreaches and excellence in the toilets. You know, Russia is uh, very mediocre. You know, Russia, for Russians, mediocrity is the norm. You know, if you go into a building, toilets are dirty, no toilet paper, nothing to dry hands with, trash bins have been not cleaned for months, the new civilization is starting over there in those trash bins and overhead projector words of songs are written with mistakes. And, you know, I believe mediocrity should not be acceptable. Successful ministry will strive for excellence in all areas of the ministry. If we want to move forward, we cannot have a mediocre mentality. In Russia, a prevailing mentality is called taksaidot. 
you don't Russian, but uh, you don't know Russian. But так сойдет means uh, something like, oh, it's gonna it's gonna be okay the way it is. Just live it. You know, we don't have to excel. We can. You know, that's good enough. And that mentality prevails in churches. And can I submit to you this morning that it is as important as all the spiritual things. It's important also to be excellent as a church in all other areas of the ministry. It starts with a pastor. In Psalms 133 it says, It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. This is an idea of oil running down from top to bottom. And uh, uh, what is on the head, the same will be on the body. It starts with the pastor and goes down to the entire church. The, the, the famous cliche sayings like people like priests and everything we are plays out in everything we touch and everything we do. That's why we should look at our disciples and pay attention to the practical areas of their lives. Is his house clean? He, or he lives like a pig. His ministry will be a pig pen. Is his car full of trash? Does he pay his bills on time? Is his nail finger uh, his nails clean? Is his clothing ironed? Are his shoes shined? Is is he on time or always late? If it is a man, uh, if it is a man, is he shaved or a woman? Hey, come on! And his hair, his hair is trimmed neatly. Uh, if a person is not organized, everything he touches will be a mess. And I've met some people, listen, don't get me wrong, I've met some wonderful guys, wonderful disciples that are on fire for God. They are prayer warriors. They can preach heaven down uh, on, the, on the crowd and the fire down. But because of this very area that they overlook, they will never succeed. They will never come up from the ground. Their church will always be uh, stay small because this area is as important as any anything else you think about when you think about spirit. In fact, some, some of the, my dear friends are tremendous men of God. They are such prayer warriors. They are very spiritual. They know the Word of God, but they can never grow their church. And because of this very issue. Because they don't understand that building a structure is as important as building it, as, as having spiritual uh, revelations and spiritual issues in place. See, also it's very interesting that the Bible speaks about Jesus ordering them to sit in the groups of 50. And uh, not in this text, obviously, but in other uh, parallel texts of the same story, the Bible speaks about Him ordering those people to sit in the groups of 50. And I know uh, uh, that any larger church We'll experience what we call people uh, back door, uh, people leaving through the back door, or people falling through the cracks. That what ha took place in my church a while black, uh, back. We had a problem uh, with people complaining, needs unmet, no time on my part because of extensive traveling and bigger church. Uh, uh, people can lose personal touch. And uh, when you reach that area, you uh, have to understand that structure has to be in place. And I've spoken with other men that are bigger than myself, and I can share and I can tell you that they have a strong emphasis on the leaders of the Bible study groups, leaders and their wives that are working in the congregation and ministering to the congregation, meeting the need, and that is very important. Pastors in our fellowship who are worth their salt will travel extensively go places. I've complained to pastors and I said, listen, I come home. I don't understand what is going on. I lose the personal touch. In fact, I love smaller churches. I love, I love, I love smaller churches because it's so wonderful. You know everybody. Everybody knows you. You have just this wonderful assembly of people and the pastor is reachable and uh, everybody has this wonderful friendship relationships. But when church becomes large, 
larger. A structure has to be implemented. And unless that is implemented, you will go insane. Moses. Here is Moses with his father-in-law. His father-in-law visits him and says, You are driving people insane, he says. Why don't you have men appointed? And we know that he appointed those men, but that was not enough. Later he had to still complain. And the Bible says, I will take your spirit and I will place that spirit on those men and they will bury your burden on their shoulders. And I believe that this is so important for a church that wants to break through through this uh, Bible study, leadership of those Bible studies. We can actually pastor church through those men. They will be the ones that will help the church to grow, stabilize the work of God. And those men, if, if they are uh, uh, oriented properly, if the uh, Bible study groups are not self-serving, but uh, they will become evangelistic in their mindset, uh, then there is no no limit to growth. We have several men in our church that have started Bible studies that turned into, and I heard through this week, uh, I think in India uh, or some other places, you, you have through the week, uh, you heard that also, that some of the men, uh, uh, one man who was now pioneering, he was so desperate, I said to him, I will not send you out unless you have fruit in your life. And he went to a city about 100 kilometers away. There was a, a couple that was saved in that city. He started at their home. He had some relatives there, uh, distant relatives. Some of them started getting saved. Long story short, there is a group of 20 plus people right now in that uh, a uh, small town of 10,000 people. This man went on to pioneer, but his life made a difference, and there is a church forming in that little town. This is what I'm talking about. You know, it's very interesting how in the larger assembly, and I don't know if you're part of a larger assembly, people lose touch with uh, their need to be involved. Right? This is one of the major problems we have. Because, uh, you know, not everybody is musical. Not everybody can play in a drama. Not everybody can, you know, there's only a certain amount of slots for ushering or Sunday school uh, teaching or even nursery. And so I found this in my church. I don't know about you, but I found this, that people have an excuse. I am not talented or, uh, you know, how many, how many worship teams can you have in a church without it being, uh, you know, you, you have to have as less uh, worship teams as possible, right? Because uh, musicians are, you know, filled with pride. And, uh, you know, Lucifer, uh, when he fell down from heaven, he fell right behind the stage uh, and uh, is working and operating. How many, how many, how many uh, you know, how many sets of musicians can you have? And what about the rest of us? What about the rest? Of the, uh, here's the people that come to a church of a considerable size and they look at the church and they say, there is no need for me to be involved. They, obviously, they can be involved in the outreach and etc. But uh, uh, the, the reason being is because uh, there is an uh, improper uh, orientation on the church. And uh, if a church becomes properly oriented, then these people will find themselves completely used and needed in the little home groups uh, throughout the city where they can minister to new converts, they can cook the food, they can clean after, they can babysit. And and if that uh, Bible study group is properly oriented, evangelistically oriented, that will be, there will be no stop to growth and those people will be excited. They will say, hey, I am playing a part. Can you say amen? Because that's the difference between a small church where everybody's involved. Have you ever wondered why in a smaller assembly you have wonderful disciples? The first disciples of any church are the more power, most powerful disciples. The more quality disciples are the ones that <clears throat> were there from the beginning. Why? Because they were involved. And so I found this solution for my church. And this solution was to organize and reorient. Our home groups were nothing but gather together another, another week of uh, night of the week. 
you know, self-serving, you know, ingrown, and you know, uh, uh, nothing, you know, just, uh, just another Bible study. And I, I, we obviously appreciate the friendship and relationships, but this is only the beginning, and, uh, uh, and it's very, very powerful when that church, that's, there's a reason why Jesus set them in the groups of 50, because he was able to minister to every one of them, and everyone was ministered to, and everyone was given bread. Everyone was fed. That's what we need. That's what we're striving for in our churches, that everyone is being fed. Not just spectators, you know, a bunch of people, a mega church mentality. They come Sunday morning, they're not involved, they're spectators, they go back. But my dream of a church, and especially in the day and time we're living, you know, it's very interesting that in our country, uh, uh, it, it, we don't know what's going to happen with the churches. You heard about Jehovah Witnesses ba banned from Russia. We could be next. And I warned my church. I preached a sermon uh, some time ago. The name of the title of the sermon was The Day That the Potter's House Burned Down. And so the main premise of that, the main idea would be that if you come, what would you do if you come to the building, you know, on Sunday morning, all dressed up, your little fluffy kids, uh, girls, they're all dressed up, you know, they're all nice and, you know, wonderful. You want to go to a cozy little building. But, you know, what if, what if you come and there is no building? It's burned down. It's closed down. It's uh, restricted by the government. And the uh, larger principle is the principle of a church that is, that is involved in a personal, personal level. And, uh, and uh, they, it can survive without being uh, uh, gathered together on Sunday morning. I wonder how many churches would survive if they, if they lost their building. Or if they were not allowed to gather anymore. Will, would we continue? Or we would say, oh, I don't have a, a preacher to hear and come to and respond and uh, pump me up. Uh, and so I'm going to backslide uh, in a week's time. You know, I, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that this uh, can happen. And I, I don't know if this is going to happen or not. I pray for revival of Russia. But I've preached that sermon and I said to the people, listen, unless we have an understanding of a first a century church, the church that has this idea behind it, then we can fail. It's very interesting, and as I close, that uh, we need to understand that one of the principles in that scenario is we need to teach our disciples to give and to serve and to help others. It's very interesting how in our text, uh, he gave the food to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. And as they turned around from Jesus and spread that leftovers or that broken bread and broken fish. And I can see them, you know, uh, breaking that fish and uh, their hands are all greasy. And then the bread and these men are hungry themselves. Everybody's hungry in that, in that assembly. And you know, when men are hungry, they can't think straight. Uh, and I wonder what would have happened, uh, you know, humorously, if those disciples did not turn around, would, did not start walking around those home groups or, or, or groups and give them fish and bread, but they would eat it all. And you know, you go to any small church, and this is exactly the scenario. Those people are, are, are they're fed themselves. They are so, so uh, fat spiritually. They can't hear another sermon, but they do not turn around. They don't, as soon as they touch the door handle of the church, they forget about a sermon that was preached. They do not give it away. They do not serve anybody. And unless that takes place, the church will never take off. And I go to small churches in Russia. And this undoubtedly, uh, uh, the same principle, I, I go, the church is not growing, I talk to people, and it's always the same. Those people don't know how to serve, they have not been taught to serve, and they don't have a desire to turn around after Sunday morning service and give bread to the new converts, spend time, sit with them, talk to them, and uh, minister to them, or go and bring that sermon to another neighborhood on Sunday afternoon, and have 
have a Bible study in between Sunday morning and Sunday night and preach that sermon to a group of people, uh, give out of, uh, flyers. Listen, you're men, you're aspiring for ministry. What are you doing? Why are you waiting for a pastor to tell you what to do? Why don't you initiate? And it's a good thing to run it by the pastor. Tell him what you have an idea about. Maybe he'll have a few words of advice. It's always very helpful. But listen, you have to go out there and, uh, and sky is the limit. Four billion people in Melbourne. Are you, are you kidding me? You can have an impact before you know it. Uh, before you are sent out, you can already have a group of people. And sky is the limit. It's very necessary the need for the disciples to learn how to give away themselves, put others first. And uh, then the Bible speaks that when they took, took the leftovers, they had 12 baskets full of leftovers. And uh, they represent, obviously, something very profound. God was breaking through the poverty mentality of these disciples. He was teaching them a lesson. If you serve me, you will come back. I believe they took everyone a basket home. And Peter showed up that night in his house. And his wife, poor wife, you know, oh, Peter, you've been away with Jesus all day. Is it worth it to serve Jesus? And as he's pulling down, putting down that basket full of leftovers, kissing his dear wife and saying listen my honey it's worth it to serve Jesus when you serve Jesus God's gonna give back in an incredible many many fold and this is the lesson of our text about growing of the church that's all I had to say this morning